All right, we're about to start our uh, panel session, the session before lunch. And I'm really uh, excited that so many of us can be up here on stage to talk about the various issues that we encounter with minors, archival materials. Uh, two of our institutions are both uh, art museums, but we handle some archival materials right here at the Portland Art Museum. Uh, and then at Princeton as well. And then some other institutions are more um, archivally based and some people have been able to visit and work with all of these archives and really um, in Ken's instance, he'll be talking first as able to uh, get into all of the archival collections uh, in great depth. So we're gonna talk about multiple things, the aspects of our archives, um, some of the problems we encounter because problems and issues come up over time and uh, as times change and we reconsider the ways to archive what we have. Um, but I, I hope that you will agree with me at the end of this that the um, ability to house and take care of um, and uh, into the future these objects um, both uh, documents, photographs, everything else that comes along with it is a critical part of the work that we do and uh, we plan to continue as best we can into the future. I will introduce our panelists first and then we will go one by one uh, and talk about our various archival situations um, and then we'll open it up to questions or any discussion before lunch. Uh, to my left on the end is Ken Hawkins. Ken began his archival career as a work-study undergrad, creating the inventory of White's WP negative, WPA negatives at the Oregon Historical Society. So the individual who asked that question about negatives and other holdings, oh, I think it was uh, Stephen. Um, Ken is the man to talk to. He earned a PhD in history at the University of Rochester and has worked at the National Archives in Washington, DC since 1993. He managed the transfer of the Obama White House electronic records to the archives, including over two million digital photographs by Pete Sousa. Uh, some of you in the audience may have uh, been in uh, Pete's audience when he was here recently, and I think he's coming again or has just come for a second time. More recently, he authored the entry on Minor White in the Oregon Encyclopedia, which was just published this past week. To my immediate left is Matthew Cowan. Matthew is the archivist for moving images and photography at the Oregon Historical Society just across the street. And prior to moving to Oregon, he worked for many years at Anthology Film Archives in New York City. To my right is Val Ballastrum, and Val is the education manager with the Architectural Heritage Center. He has a master's degree in history and public history from Portland State University. In 2017, he curated the Architectural Heritage Center's exhibit, Parting Shots, Minor White's Images of Portland, 1938 to 1942, which included matching several of White's photographs with artifacts from buildings that appear in the photographs. The exhibit just received an Oregon Heritage Excellence Award from the Oregon Heritage Commission. And hopefully some of you were able to see that absolutely fantastic exhibition um, at the at the center, but Val will be showing you some photographs of the installation. And to my right on the end is Catherine Goodwin. Catherine is manager of collections information at the Princeton University Art Museum and oversees the cataloging of and access to information about works of art. Catherine's particular interests are open access to art information and images for research and scholarship and cross-institutional collections discovery. So we will begin uh, with Ken's roundup, if you will, of his experiences in these various archives. Let's go green. Thank you, Julia, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, this is a session near and dear to my heart. Um, one of the great things about archives is that they can take you behind the scenes and also behind the official narrative um, of any given topic. And th these two photos here sort of do that um, in, a, in kind of a snapshot way. The one on the left is a um, uh, Minor White's first four by five inch negative in his archive. It's an AGFA um, nitrate based uh, film. It was taken early in 1938 up uh, along First Street between Pine and Oak. 
Um, so he was interested in, in the architecture of the old buildings and also the quality of light um, from before, six months at least before he was actually hired to work for the WPA. Um, the second one on the right there is a WPA um, photograph, um, but it's uh, untitled as it's held by the Portland Art Museum, and it's also as a circa date. Um, interestingly, Miner excluded uh, the waterfront portfolio from his memoirs, uh, even though it was circulated uh, in, in exhibitions under the WPA. Um, and one, if one starts to try to integrate and do research in the various archival repositories of WPA prints, you can fill in those dates so we can identify the date this was taken and we can also identify the exact location, um, not just from research, but from other WPA prints that actually are captioned. Um, so White began his career as part of a trust to create artwork in the public domain. His writing and teaching aimed to eliminate barriers between amateur and advanced photographers. And he wanted to reach people uh, from all backgrounds and get them interested in photography and camera clubs in, at the YMCA and these community art centers. Um, as he wrote uh, just a, a year or so after he arrived in Portland, he said, quote, we would like to foster a spirit of comradeship in picture taking. So this is kind of my attempt at a, at a timeline of the relationship between um, his work here in Portland, the five years he was here in Oregon between 1937 and 1942. And so the top is kind of a picture cloud going over the um, kind of the subject matter and the, and the locations of his photographs um, while he was here in the state. Um, and one of the things that I have tried to do in the, um, in the presentation here is to, to use pictures that are not from the print portfolios so you can get a little bit of flavor of what kind of the outtakes are or what some of the, the pictures are behind the actual portfolios. So with limited exceptions, such as the man standing in the doorway, the Dodd building, um, a good number of the, of the remaining photos will be from the minor white archive or from the OHS negative set to sort of make some of the points that I wanna make. Um, so along, uh, along the bottom, and it may be obscure, but it's basically a timeline, 37 to 42. And what I did was sort of describe uh, or put bars in for the different repositories and the coverage that they have across those years. That is, the materials, for example, uh, on the bottom in blue at OHS, that set of 200 negatives basically covers from about October 1938 to June of 1940. Um, and then it sort of cuts off. The Portland Art Museum has this found set of negatives that picks up from about January of 1940 and goes through uh, the, the latter part of the year and sort of fills in the gaps. And then Princeton, of course, has archival material that predates his Portland years to some extent, but then also goes well into uh, the future um, and, and up through the 1960s, so as we saw from Ian's presentation. Um, give a shout out to the county library uh, its portfolio is actually the only complete finished portfolio with captions in sequence as was originally intended. Um, everything else are, are basically the, the, the portfolios that were transferred uh, as a whole and so the, the exact order is not really known and of course for someone for whom sequences became important later on it's, it's interesting to see kind of this one early example uh, that was turned over in the summer of 1939. So, um, I've, uh, if you consider his work as a whole, what happened in 1942, I kind of use the analogy of taking a deck of cards, cutting it, and never shuffling those two sides of the deck back together. The work, the, the underlying negatives and the prints were basically split up. So, as Julia said, there's about 107 or 108 prints here. There's 200 negatives at OHS, there's these other sets. But White took about three times as many negatives from this period with him that, en that ended up at Princeton after his death. And I think there's altogether maybe about 150 prints from the Oregon period. But, uh, which was sort of mind-boggling to me that there was so much work that was behind the official prints and the prints that he also chose to include in his, um, in his memoirs and in his sort of retrospective musings in, in um, 
uh, memorable fancies. So you could extend the timeline to include other repositories and also including the National Archives where the WPA records are, which fill in a lot of the context. Um, when he, and also you could, the, the Portland period, when he came here for the, uh, the Centennial Exposition and put together the, the um, Return of the Bud, there were about four or five pictures from the Portland years, and that's included in that exhibit. And he was also beginning to formulate his memoirs and the ideas behind his memoirs. So he was looking back, and when that exhibit was installed here in Portland in 1959, he wrote in his journal, I feel that a trajectory that started in Portland, Oregon in 1938 has been completed. These pictures, made as long as 20 years ago for reasons far different from now, are being torn from their original context to serve a different purpose. It's a little terrifying. So uh, White omitted critical aspects of his work and life in telling it as a, as a uh, trajectory of photographing manifestations of spirit from Portland and back. For that matter, the portfolios of historic Portland also wove a narrative. Um, and then, of course, the dispersal and sort of the alienation of the records into all these far-flung reaches also makes it a bit of a challenge to put his life back together and sort of get at behind the scenes as to what was, what was his life like, what were the forces that were shaping his work uh, at a lower level than just the narrative he told or the narrative that the WPA told. Um, so when you, start, when you start digging into the archives, they are rich with stories that are outside those sanctioned narratives. Um, within a year of, of uh, arriving here, he was writing a how-to column for the Bonneville uh, Gun and Rod Club and put uh, into print their, it's, uh, his earlier ideas about, uh, he reminded his uh, photography students and readers that to think ahead about what effect the photograph would have on the viewer before you took it. He also was interested in eliminating the barrier between amateurs and professionals or accomplished photographers. So he's very interested in teaching and sort of reaching out and having a life in photography that wasn't just the sort of rarefied narrative. And certainly that's a thread, but there's a lot of teaching, a lot of thought going into this. Um, and uh, interestingly, just by going and visiting the archives, that publication from May and July of 38 is five years earlier than the other previously earliest documented article that he wrote, which was in 1943. So just sort of digging in the archives, you can find some really cool stuff. Um, speaking of which, uh, the photograph there in the middle is the earliest dated um, photograph in the Minor White Archive from December 22nd, 1937. And it goes to one of his other favorite sort of offline topics of, of shooting was nocturnal or nighttime photography. So it's a picture of the Christmas display at the Beverly Hotel, December 22nd, 1937. Um, and then just some of the other outtakes that sort of uh, show his work on the street. And he used to, he was using also the small handheld camera medium format. And so he actually was a fairly accomplished street photographer and, and had an affinity for taking pictures of people. The lower right there is just basically a document from the WPA uh, files that's uh, a request for a biographical sketch. So E.J. E. Griffith put together, talked to Minor, put together a short biographical sketch. It mentions Bonneville, it mentions a couple other things, it mentions the five-year plan. So um, it's just kind of a nice little um, addition. So the, uh, his WPA assignment came, uh, he was doing all that kind of work, making friends, and uh, he got the job, actually Joseph Danish, who was in San Francisco and was a friend of Ansel Adams, who had set up that, the gallery in the 1930s, was the regional administrator of the art program for the WPA, and he basically was pulling the strings behind the scenes to get a creative photographer hired in Oregon, and that, the wheels were turning on that from early 1937. They weren't happy with the staff photographer, they wanted a creative photographer. And it's a good thing to note that, that the WPA's creative photographers are different from the ones that were hired by the Farm Security Administration, like Dorothy Lang and Arthur Rothstein and the others. So they were doing more truly creative original work and included the Westons, who there are papers in the, in the archives that indicate that they didn't, that Edward Weston specifically didn't want it publicized that he was working for the WPA. But there are prints of his in collections. So when he was hired by Marjorie Hoffman Smith, his, his remit here for the WPA work was to, quote, document by nostalgia. 
and this aligned with the, the Federal Art Project's goal to create a usable past through art made broadly available to the public. Uh, so he captured scenes of historic Portland in the portfolios, largely without reminders of modern life so that the viewer could imagine the pride that those earlier citizens had in their city, and those were basically his words. So for the most part, when you look at the portfolios for the historic Portland, he would choose times of day when there were no cars around and to sort of you know, imagine what the earlier period had been like, and they also were largely absent of people, unlike his, his offline photography. Um, they also remarkably included, well, they were telling the story, so they included no photos of the demolition, but if you look at the OHS set, probably 50% of those are actual photographs of the demolition. So I just chose a couple of, of these photographs from uh, the left ones from the Minor White Archive, there's a very close parallel one at OHS of the view uh, of the Dodd and uh, building on Front Avenue um, from the New Market Theater. And then he often would incorporate modern cars in these pictures of the old buildings. And the one on the lower right is also from uh, the, the Minor White Archive that shows some of the demolition work that was going on. So his negatives have proven quite useful over the years for historians of Portland architecture um, and history. Um, in fact, they probably were more widely used and disseminated as architectural history, at least in the local you know, press, than they, they had been, been used um, elsewhere or that he elected to use. So um, the, uh, the other interesting thing is that um, he, in his memoir, he acknowledged the WPA or origins of his Portland photographs, um, but um, of his, of his, of the architectural photographs, but he ignored the waterfront portfolio in his memoirs, and that portfolio was done at the same time, um, and was with a much more sort of modernist vision. So, um, just in sort of combing through the archives at Princeton, and then in the set of negatives that Julia referenced from that came mysteriously to the art museum in the 1950s, they have copy photographs of some of the other. Oregon Art Project uh, artwork that was done. And there's a particular painter, Virginia Darcy, who painted this image on the right, which is, I think, basically one of them is modeled on the other, or it's the Cooch Street dock. So if you look at the alignment of the buildings, the, sh the, the smokestack of the ship that's docked there, it's, it's essentially a take on the same scene. And it may have just been a coincidence since the Cooch Street dock was three blocks north of the Oregon Art Project headquarters, but it was just a nice little discovery in the archives. So um, basically, the, uh, going back to the narrative that was established by the WPA, the WPA central office curated the exhibitions. They selected the photographs, they assembled them, they matted them, they framed them. The prints were sent back to Washington, but the, the exhibits were actually assembled there, and so of all the photographs that were done, they made a, a subset into the exhibits, and those went through the art centers. So as Julie mentioned, and Ian, you know, his, the, the Legrand period when he goes up to Eastern Oregon and he's teaching and then managing the art center, that whole center was really about putting artwork in the hands of the community and having classes and um, running activities, and so his actual first nationally published photographs came from that period. They appeared in the American Federation of Arts Art Magazine, magazine of Art from Washington, D.C., and it's a photo that's probably familiar to some of us, this, the art auction from the WPA's National Art Week, so they, it was this big push by the central WPA administration to promote community engagement and to essentially create an arcet, a market for art that was sort of midway between uh, sort of popular art and, and fine art. And he, um, uh, his work was actually praised in an editorial in the Legrand newspaper that was picked up and published and abstracted into, this, into the magazine of art. And Eleanor Roosevelt, who was visiting the art gallery of the WPA in Washington, had stopped by, so the assistant administrator said, I'm sorry I missed you in a letter, but I wanted to tell you more about the art project. And so she sent the editorial about the Grand Art Center um, to uh, Mrs. Roosevelt and um, quoted from it. But she also said uh, to her that the art center is designed to serve all classes of people. Its doors are wide. There are no restrictions as to race or creed, no requirements as to previous special training. 
So I just wanted to kind of emphasize that this was the context in which Minor White's career and the values that shaped it started. So this symposium is really an excellent beginning to sort of looking at the archival kind of context and, 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 the, um, and the resources. And I hope as we go forward that, that we will be able to sort of virtually reunite the archives and also uh, in doing that, make sure that all of the WPA photographs are clearly and explicitly identified so that the people who are out there using them know that they are, are uh, in the public domain and freely accessible. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, uh, I don't have any slides. Um, I am an archivist at the Oregon Historical Society. I started there five years ago, almost exactly. Um, and I came in not just for photography, but also for moving images, film, and, and video. So I really split my time. And really, my background is actually more in, in motion picture, film preservation, uh, and archiving. Um, but I, you know, I went to art school. I knew who Minor White was when I showed up here. And I was like, why, why, why do we have all these original Minor White negatives? Um, and you know, I'm still honestly asking myself that question, uh, even though, uh, thanks to Ken, uh, a lot of that is starting to come into play, but really what I inherited was approximately, I think, 205 negatives, plus or minus one, um, a bunch of folders with a lot of correspondences and copies of newspaper articles and lots and lots of question marks. Uh, there seemed to be an assumption that these were produced as a WPA-funded project, um, but there was no clear definition that that was actually the case. Um, it was interesting to see some of Julia's slides this morning. We do not have any correspondences from Minor. We do not have any documentation. We do not have accession records. There's literally no mention at all of why, when, or how they came into the collection. And I think what Ken has been doing recently has helped to kind of answer some of those questions, which is super helpful. Even. I mean, what was it, a week or two ago, uh, Ken sent uh, basically a well-researched document solidifying that these were public domain WPA documents, and that was literally just a couple weeks ago that we, you know, in my mind, got first real solid evidence that that was the case. Uh, OHS for a long time, and maybe still is, is very risk adverse when it comes to things like copyright, so that really held us back in terms of making them available because we really weren't sure where they were. Um, so one of the first things I did was created uh, what I called an illustrated inventory, which I think was for the first time where we had minors negative numbers, our negative numbers, a description of the content, and an actual scan of the photo all in the same spreadsheet. And I was able to share that with Ken. Uh, I think I've shared it with Julia and other people. So for the first time, these things were all linked together and I, th I hope, at least, that that helped move some of these things along. Um, but it just, there was a lot of questions. Um, some examples of that is we have documentations from the 70s of OHS staff members coming to the art museum saying, why do we have these? Do you have these? Why do you have them? And the art museum saying, we don't know why we have these either. These funny kind of memos dictating this. Uh, and OHS for a long time, well into the 2000s, had a wet lab, a functioning wet lab at our facility. Uh, and so what happened in the 70s is we said to the, the art museum, oh, you have all these prints. We will make copy negatives of these prints if we can keep copies for ourselves so that we can have them available for researchers in our library. So we actually, which only, in some ways added the confusion is that we then had all of the negatives, we don't know why, where they came from. We then had all these funny PAM prints and copy negatives that we soon lost track of why we had them. So coming to the 80s and 90s, we just have all these minor white materials, again, with no clear definition. Um, so it led to, uh, at least for me, coming in five years ago, just a lot, of, a lot of questions. And I could tell people, kind of my predecessors had the same questions. And, you know, I work in a 100,000 square foot warehouse out in Gresham. We have, you know, I see Tom here and John, like we have millions and millions and millions and millions of photo negatives, glass negatives, cased images. So minor white then, this one little tiny, tiny collection is just one drop in this bucket. Uh, so it's easy, I think, for people to say, well, why do we have these things? And then they, the next week they move on to something else. Uh, so there's kind of this funny buildup. Uh, one thing of note, kind of the only thing we have that lists maybe that Minor gave them to us is there was a newspaper article presumably written when Minor came to town in 1960, and there's a brief little, little one line in the article that says, 
When Miner left to go to World War II, he left all WPA, non-WPA images with the Oregon Historical Society and the Portland Art Museum. It is not a quote, it is just the, the, the journalist included it in there. So literally then we clung to that one little bit of thing and just passed it down now decades later. Uh, so it's really great to be able to be a part with people who are more minor white scholars who can answer some of these questions and then we can work towards getting them you know, more publicly available and work with places like Princeton. Thank you. Matthew, that was um, a great entryway, entry point for me to talk about uh, a particular situation. Uh, because we have our minor white works in some ways in different places. So we, of course, have the prints um, amongst our artworks with our accessioned works of art in the collection. Um, we then have some records that pertain to those works of art in the registrar's office. We then have uh, the negatives that came from the WPA semi-mysteriously in the early to mid-1950s um, in our library's archives. Uh, they have recently been moved actually to our freezer because uh, some deterioration is starting to happen, so we needed to stop that, uh, and we need to have those uh, negatives conserved. So we have these different pockets of minor white objects in, in these different places. And um, as Matthew had mentioned, it, it takes a long time sometimes to unravel these mysteries and then to properly treat the objects. So I'm going to talk about, um, we, you may remember this slide, I had this up earlier, the 1942 photographs of the Dolphin Lindley houses uh, that were then uh, subsequently torn down in 1942 and then uh, 1951. Uh, and Val will talk about those as well. Because he made those photographs at a time that he was about to leave for basic training, he had been he had been drafted. It's 1942. He was drafted in April, and so he had to leave them behind. And he's, um, you know, first of all, we see here the board of trustees says, "Yes, we will pay Minor White $150 to make these photographs of historic houses." He makes them. He leaves, and then we have evidence uh, that he, while um, in uh, relocated to Hawaii, he is concerned about those negatives. Are they good enough? How did the prints go? Was Grant able to print from them, and so on. Um, and that leaves him in a place where he has no control over these works. Uh, this is part of the file as well, which I thought was really interesting. Um, we have, I think, a little over 100 of the original negatives. Uh, but I love seeing that Miner actually made sort of schematic floor plan drawings of, of what he was actually um, about to work on at the time. And so what we have Originally, as we had a set of negatives, those negatives were printed by a man named Grant. Those prints were shown on a couple of occasions. So to me, in many ways, the vintage, the closest that we get to the negative is from those 1942 prints. But you'll notice when you see um, these numbers, our accession numbers, so um, the prints that I'm talking about that were made in 1942 for the exhibition in 1942 that Grant made, they have an accession number over here of 2017, um, which means that we technically acquired them, even though we've always had them and they're our property, uh, we brought them into the fine art collection just last year, technically. Um, but then the negatives have an accession number of 1942. That's what the 42.30.45 and so on are. Um, and this is where if you hear the term best practice for whatever business you're in or whatever type of work you do, best practice changes over time. And things were a little looser uh, you know, back in the day. Um, we, what ended up happening, I'll go back for a second, is that for some reason, the negatives were given the original 1942 accession number and then they, the prints were matched to that number and then later prints were made as well. So in many cases, we ended up having three objects under a single number. And we can't do that. It just, it doesn't work. Um, every object, every unique object has to have its own unique number or else we can't find it, right? If we need it, or like which one is the original? Which one is the one that we want to use? And so for whatever reason, and, and mainly because everybody's super busy over the past, how many years now, 70 years, um, 
these objects had a single number, even though there were three of them at a time. And we finally were able to start working through um, taking care of these objects and getting them their proper numbers so that we can then get them photographed, get them online, and get them to people who may want to research them or just you know have a look. I'm showing you this too because this indicates the next set of prints that was made. In 1979, some of you may personally have known Al Monner, wonderful photographer. We have over 100 of his photographs in the collection. These negatives that were accessioned objects were handed over to him in 1979. We don't really do that kind of thing anymore. And um, as you can see, hand carried by Mr. Monner, and he made contact prints from them. And if you look at the top right, it says, uh, making two sets of contact prints for records and reference, one set for Princeton Art Museum. So Peter Bunnell had asked for his own set of contact prints to keep them with everything else that he had of minors in Princeton. So Al Monner went very diligently, made two sets of contact prints. Um, which made it very interesting because then I'm showing you here what we have. We've got the negative on the left, which is the original object. And then we've got an Al Monner print. And if you flip to the other side of the contact print, the accession number is the same accession number as the negative. So in certain instances, I've got a negative, I've got the 1942 print, and then I also have the 1979 print, and they all have the same number. So we had to, over a couple of days, and I'm looking at our um, head of library and, and, uh, um, and online, I, Maggie, I apologize, I'm forgetting your entire title because it's wonderful. Um, but our head of library and our registrars and I had to sit down and figure out what we wanted where and where we wanted to say, this is an object that needs to remain with the art collection. These are objects that need to be moved to the archival side. Uh, and to add another layer, we also have another full set of photographs from the negative. We have a full set of prints that Stu Levy, many of you know Stu Levy, made back in about 1994 or 1995 because uh, some of you may know the book Heritage Lost. There's a wonderful book called Heritage Lost that is all about the Dolphin Lindley houses. And we didn't have a full set of the original prints, um, and aesthetics had changed a little bit. They were perhaps not big enough and so on. So Stu printed an entire new <laughs> round of prints from the negatives, and those were accessioned into the art collection in 1995. So at any given time, uh, I'll go to this first, I may have four objects. Uh, the negative and then three prints, one from 1942, one from 1979, and one from 1995. So these are the things that we on occasion have to parse out. Um, and I show you this, this was uh, quite a find that I found just last week at Princeton. This is a letter from Minor, not at all remembering that the museum had any of his work. Um, I don't know, you know, this is 1973, so he's ill at this point. Um, it's also like 40 years on, but he doesn't remember that we had his work. And he says, you know, I've heard this information. If you had negatives, can I, I'll return them, but can I print from them? Um, again, not something we would do today. But then um, at the time, Bill Foster, our, uh, who's now the head of the uh, film center, who is our assistant registrar, he says, oh no, well these are all the things that we have of yours. Um, sure, you know, if you wanna print from your negatives, that's fine. And yes, we will absolutely take other photographs that you have as well, because Minor says, well, I have other work too. Would you like some other work? Um, unfortunately, we didn't get any additional work from him at that time. Uh, so, these are the types of issues that do come up with someone whose work, uh, the original negatives have passed from place to place. Um, there are people involved in different areas trying to do really good things, but um, even the simple act of giving every object its own number becomes incredibly important. So these are the types of things that our registrars, that we as curators, that our archivists and our librarians work with on a day-to-day -day basis, again, so that information can get out to the public uh, more readily online. Hello. 
So, uh, in 2017, uh, the Architectural Heritage Center, where I work, uh, we had this exhibit, Minor White Parting Shots, uh, images of Portland 1938 to 1942, and we were, if you're not familiar with the Architectural Heritage Center, we have thousands and thousands of pieces of buildings that were torn down over many decades, um, mostly from the 50s into the 80s, but uh, we have a few earlier things uh, that have come through various sources over the years. And one of the things that we knew we had were pieces from a couple of houses. Uh, the, what we call the Knapp House, uh, referred to it here as the Lindley House, um, but also the Dolph House uh, as well. And so um, we uh, approached uh, the Portland Art Museum and Oregon Historical Society knowing, thanks to Ken, uh, I had had a little insider knowledge that they had the OHS had that spreadsheet that Matt mentioned uh, with the photos, and I was like, can I see that? And so one thing led to another, and then the Art Museum gave the okay, and the Oregon Historical Society gave the okay to use prints from, uh, to make prints from, from files that they provided. So I spent lots of hours poring over uh, images, digital images that they provided me uh, so I could see sort of the details. Because from our point of view, we were, we were interested in what might be in those images that um, shows up in some of our, our, or where we have artifacts, right? So uh, this is an example of some of the photos we had. Here we have a better view. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. So we, you know, like I said, I poured, poured over these images and I had to pare it down at one point, you know, to uh, roughly three dozen photos uh, where I knew that we didn't have uh, artifacts that showed up in every one of those photos, but we had a lot of wall space to fill. And so uh, one of our main, our main gallery we used with, with uh, artifacts from the Dolph House, which are the, 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 the wooden pieces you see here on the right, or actually throughout that image there, those wooden pieces are all from the Dolph House. Um, and the image, on the, there's a metal piece at the far right there that you can sort of make out is, is a, a piece from a building called the Lad Block, which we also have several artifacts from. Here's a close-up of that, and I think uh, the photo here was shown earlier. Um, and these photos, I wanted to when I when I selected them, I wanted to. I was, you know, like I said, I was looking for details to find uh, architectural, you know, artifacts in, in the in the background of these photos. And um, you can't see it here, but in the background, you could just make out one of these one of these uh, metal stamped metal features, and there's actually one right over the, sort of right over the doorway where that fellow is standing, and then these two guys are standing, or sitting in front of the junk store, but at, in the background at the corner is another view of the same building, and I was like, oh, there it is. We can show these. You know, so we had these, uh, these two images associated with the lad block, even though the lad block as a whole was not shown in Minor White's photos. And this was a really different approach to doing exhibit, an exhibit for us. Um, Architectural Heritage Center for years, we've done exhibits related to building material types or other aspects of Portland history with the, with the buildings and the artifacts sort of being the focus. But in this instance, we had these awesome photos with these great details and we had artifacts to sort of supplement the photos. So it was sort of flipping our, our usual approach to exhibits on its head hugely successful, very, uh, people were very interested and I was uh, very happy with that. Um, and it turned out to be our most popular exhibit ever. Uh, this, and I wish it was still open because we still get people interested. Um, so, the, the house photos in particular uh, are where we have most of the artifacts. Unfortunately, um, as Ken sort of alluded to, a lot of the, the Front Avenue buildings were being torn down or just about to be torn down when Minor White took the photos in the late 30s, early 40s. And um, so the, uh, that was before people were salvaging from these buildings, and so not a lot of the cast iron pieces and so forth survived, with a few exceptions. 
Um, you can come to the Architectural Heritage Center and in our lobby are a couple of pieces from a building called the CAM Block that uh, actually stood until, it survived until 1949. And um, we have a couple of pieces from that sort of on permanent display in our lobby there. And they're, it's, it's an amazing thing to see every day. I come to work and I see these things and I'm just like blown away. So I recommend if you haven't come seen those to at least come, come into our lobby and take a look. Um, but uh, a lot of the earlier pieces uh, from the commercial buildings didn't survive. But the houses, uh, we were super fortunate. Um, a couple of things. This is, there's two photos on the right in this that are from <clears throat> the, the Lindley house or the Knapp house. And this is like one of the smallest rooms in the house. And this is one wall. And it's almost 12, this section is only, almost 12 feet tall. Um, it was just amazing for us to construct in this room, and I told this story just the other day, how we were uh, getting ready to assemble this exhibit and realized that the Architectural Heritage Center, our, our main exhibit space, we have 14 foot tall ceilings. We thought we could, we could put this whole wall together, right? It's taller, the room was taller than our huge sort of storefront building space, you know, so, so we couldn't actually install the entire space, or, you know, or, all the trim that we actually have. And in this particular instance, we were fortunate that when, when that house was torn down in 1951, uh, it was really well documented. There was a whole uh, sort of an estate sale of pieces from the house and people were able to come in and bid on, on basically whole rooms full of wood, uh, trim and, and so forth. And so uh, some, some people uh, acquired a bunch of that and about, 50 odd years later, they donated it to the Architectural Heritage Center. So we were fortunate to actually have all this stuff. And all we had to do was basically dust it off and you know, like with a wet cloth, sort of lightly clean it up. And it just, it's 1880s wood. It's absolutely an amazing condition. So we were able to do that and, and match it up again with Minor White's photos. And with the stained glass window, this is actually uh, from the turret in the, in the house. And I was really excited because Minor White took an actual photo out the window, looking out that window. So we actually have that window. So that was a pretty amazing moment when we were able to sort of put those two together. So this was just, you know, a great, uh, for us at the Architectural Heritage Center, this was like the first time we were able to actually work together with other institutions locally and really put together something that I think was really dynamic and that really engaged a lot of people and really brought a lot of, ten of attention to our organization that was, that was, you know, having been there 10 years, I was like, I know we're doing good work, and it's like, finally we connected. So it was a really, it was a really good thing and powerful thing, and I'm thankful to all these guys here for helping us make that happen. So thank you. And see, uh, some of the things that we've attempted to do here with the Minor White Archive in Princeton. Um, first, I'd like to just say thank you to Julia and to Charles and everyone who made this possible. This has been just so fascinating for me this morning. And just following up on Val's last, com last comment, collaboration is really what's driving a lot of the interest that, that we have in the work that we're doing with the Minor White Archive at Princeton. Um, as you can see, uh, the Princeton uh, University Art Museum holds the bulk of Minor White's photographs and professional archive. It was entrusted by the artist after his death in 1976, and in the early 1980s, the materials were generally organized by Peter Bennell, whom you've probably heard mentioned here a couple of times this morning into a photography department storeroom, the Minor White Archive Room, as it was known for many, many years, with a two-page description of a finding aid, which, and I mean, I will be a little more fair than that. There were some inventories, the negatives, which, as you can see, number, uh, well, first of all, the paper archives, over 50 boxes of paper archives, including the artists, Memoirs, memorable fancies, which you've heard mentioned this morning, um, unpublished uh, mock-ups for Aperture Magazine, 
correspondence, his exhibition work, his teaching notes, just endless amounts of, of correspondence. Nearly 19,000 of Minor White's negatives are in the Princeton University Art Museum archive. These, fortunately, were processed to a, to a very large degree by uh, Peter Bennell in the 1980s, and we do have the artist's negative numbers assigned to these negatives. Um, an important point for working with Minor White is that he did, in fact, number his photographs, every one of them, we hope. <laughs> every once in a while, he numbered more than one of them in the same way, but not, not that often, honestly. It's, it, it is the core of how we organize this material. And without it, I, I think we would really be floundering. So, uh, We also have over 18,000 proof prints and finished prints in the Minor White Archive, and 5,544 proof cards where Minor did contact prints of the, from the negatives with his own notes, titles, dates, and instructions for developing those particular images. So that's just to give you a bit of a sense of what's in the Minor White Archive. When I first came to Princeton in 2005, I was told that we had the Minor White Archive, that everything Minor White ever did was in Princeton, which in fact turned out not to be true. And when we started processing the archive, we were going through all of these proof cards that I mention here. There are blank cards in our files for all of the negatives that are in the Oregon Historical Society and all of the negatives that are in the California Historical Society. They have numbers, we have no image, but anyway, this was the big effort that uh, Peter Bunnell made to try to pull together the whole body of Minor White's work in the Princeton Archive. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what we've done so far, which is why I'm standing here at the podium. Um, with the generous support of the Institute of the Museum and uh, Library Services about four years ago, we were funded to do a digitization and cataloging project for over 6,000 finished prints in the Minor White Archive. And to publish those, which we did, in the Minor White Archive website. So I'm not sure if many of you have seen this. I think everyone on the panel has probably visited this uh, site. We're, we're fairly proud of it, although we're very eager to say that this is just the beginning of what needs to be done. We have here, as I said, published some 6,000 images, prints I'm talking about. And in many cases, they're associated proof cards. So this is a query on the keyword Portland. These are images in the Minor White Archive from uh, Minor's years in Portland, as you can see. And uh, it will be interesting to look and see. This is one of those uh, images that we discussed earlier where um, the negative will be here and not in Princeton because we have no proof print, no proof card for this image. We do, in fact, have the negative number, which is, as, as Julia was pointing out earlier, a separate number from our accession number for the object itself, for the print itself. Moving along a little bit further, I'm hoping to find a photograph here that will have a proof card for you. Here's one. So in its entirety, the material that we've put in online includes digital uh, versions of these proof cards. As you can see, there are notes on the front and the back in Miner's hand. They're uh, organized by the um, negative number. And in addition, we include all um, published titles that we are aware of for these prints. Uh, again, something that becomes really tricky when you're trying to do research on Minor White because lots of people have photographs. Um, lots of people call them different things and they've been published differently over the years. So one of the goals of the archive is to try to compile all of these different published sources so that 
um, scholars will be able to be sure that they're finding the work that they think they're looking at. And then in addition, obviously, we have <clears throat> any kind of inscriptions and marks that are on the photographs themselves. So this is about the scope of what we're um, publishing now on the website. But what we'd like to be able to do is to um, include the over 18,000 negatives which have since been scanned. Let me see if I can get back to my, yay. PowerPoint. So what we're hoping to do, um, our ongoing work and goals for the Minor White Archive include uh, the current two-year term of a cataloger in the Minor White Archive who has in fact processed, inventoried, and is cataloging the probably in excess of 7,000 unnumbered finished prints in the Minor White Archive. Those are being reconciled back to the negatives and so are being um, cross-referenced with the negative numbers. We, we are planning a summer 2017, oh, 2018 internship to create a finding aid to the paper archive. This is our big, huge goal. We're hoping that this will make life for all of our visiting fellows a whole lot easier. And um, we're putting great hope and faith in our summer intern who is actually has great experience in photography archives. We have um, hope to digitize critical elements of the paper archive, some of which has been made much more clear to me just today by seeing the kinds of things that all of you are looking for when you come to do research in the Minor White Archive and obviously from the research visits which have been increasingly um, frequent over the last four years, and uh, which is a wonderful thing because every time research is done in the archive, we learn more about the material that we have. And then, of course, we would like to make the Minor White Archive website really be a platform, a portal to all of Minor White's work. We're currently um, upgrading our technology to allow for the contribution of digital resources from other repositories of Minor White material. And we are hoping, of course, to collaborate with all of the other repositories of minor white materials in order to make that possible. Collaboration being, as I said, our, our greatest goal. And, and um, so thank you. This is what we've been up to at Princeton. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, we are right on time. It's noon. Uh, bumping up against the lunch hour, but does anybody have any questions for any members of the panel before we do break for lunch? Uh, we will be reconvening if you are available at 1.30 for our next set of, of, of talks. Thank you. I'm compiling a list of minor white workshops, dates and locations, all of the Oregon workshops. Anybody else working on that? I know. I'm. I, it's so helpful, um, you know, to know that you're doing that because I've always heard about it from people like Bill Galen or, or um, you know, it, people who are involved with camera work gallery here and so on. But it was amazing. I've never, for the most part, seen paperwork, and we have almost nothing in our archives. They have, at, I would say, a, at least a full box, if not more. The amount of information that the Princeton um, archive has is unbelievable, it's everything. It's letters back and forth with um, it Jerry Robinson and uh, all of the players who were involved uh, in putting the government, the um, state of Oregon governmental notes and requesting Minor to start doing the, the workshop and then the art museum school taking over. Uh, the archive is unreal, it has everything. It's fantastic. Are, are you getting Jerry's papers? Whose papers? Jerry Robinson's Jerry paper. Robinson, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah, we're, um, it's interesting for us, and this is something um, that oftentimes people will reach out to us in terms of archives. 
We are a fine art museum, so our ability to host archives is, is very limited. Uh, and there are sometimes better places for particular archives. And in particular, we've been talking about negatives. Negatives are very problematic because of the type of care that they need, the type of room that they take, um, and their purposes. So for the most part, and I'm not necessarily saying that Jerry's archive has, has negatives, I don't know. But for the most part, we're not set up to take negatives. And we do have some. And we have acquisitioned, accessioned uh, the, the negatives that Minor made specifically for the museum, but that's a very particular case. We do, we don't have the structure to do perhaps what um, an institution like Princeton does that has a larger library system can do. So uh, or OHS or University of Oregon is an example uh, where larger archives can go as well. I I will just only add that. Um, the museum at Princeton manages the Minor White Archive, and this is a huge challenge for us. Uh, we are not, again, built to be an archive or a library, and so we are, um, even as we speak, developing methodologies for recording and, and keeping connected yet separate these individual pieces of the photographic process, which is very challenging in an art museum record keeping framework. And so it's, it's an ongoing uh, effort to try to find the best way to do that that will also be transparent for researchers. I think as you can see though that um, we all do care so much about these objects and they are critical to our understanding of minor and even 40 years after his death we're still trying to piece together facts and ideas and um, so keeping all of these things together and then working together and then pushing information online which oftentimes will bring information back to us is is really critical to um, stewarding this information and these archives hi my name is Joan thank you um, I have an archival question um, you had mentioned that it's really important to have a unique uh, number uh, for every object and then um, you had mentioned that what was wonderful about this collection, about White's collection, was that there was a unique number with every, and you used the term photograph. And then later you said that, but well, we have a bunch of prints that have nothing on them, and you're now in the process of cross-referencing those prints with those negatives. So I would imagine when you said photograph, you meant negatives had all been numbered with unique numbers? Yes. Yes, well, yes. I was re referring to the fact that minor White... Um, assigned a particular number to every photograph he took, which then yes. um, became a negative and very likely multiple prints. And yes. so all the multiple prints that you're now working with at different time periods, those will all be cross-referenced with that original negative number yes. in your, and the public will be able to follow that through on. That's online. the goal, yes. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> That's the challenge, yes. Fabulous. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. In in the in the website that I I showed earlier, there are some four thousand five hundred unique um, compositions, unique images, um, but there are six thousand separate prints. So there are multiple prints um, in our in our collection, of course, and then there are many others all around the world. One of the great things, too, about the, um, the negatives in, that, in the numbering system is, um, unlike the prints, which you know, were the ones that were chosen to be printed and then sort of you know, maybe put out of order or ended up somewhere else, the negatives are in chronological order. And then they're numbered pretty much sequentially as well. And he, he had several numbering systems, but the, it, usually the year was always included, and then there was an, a numeric sequence like 38-1, 38-50, et cetera. And on some of the aperture cards, when he went back later, he actually wrote like 38-1, 38-15. He wrote like what date the photo was of the cam house, which helped me sort of put those numeric ones into, into order, give a date to them. And then later on, he adopted a system that actually was a, a six-digit 
um, representation of the year, month, and day, and then the number of the, the frame that he took. So in many cases, you can look at and compare those and see, well, OHS has a negative that Princeton has a print of, or Princeton has the next two or three negatives in the sequence, and, and then sort of vice versa. And some of the WPA prints also have varying levels of specificity in that regard, which really helps um, you sort of tie it all together from a, a archival control standpoint and also the informational value that's in them. Photographers, keep your negatives tidy, yeah. please. <laughs> it really helps if any of your work comes to an institution. It helps us immensely. Here we are, like I said, here we are. 40 years after his death, still putting the puzzle pieces together. And he was so wonderful about, about uh, the information that he added to his negatives. Yeah, he, um, the other thing I wanted to mention quickly too that I forgot to say is the WPA funded his, hired him, he was doing government work and creating this, this narrative of Historic Portland, but the WPA also was partially funding the demolition of the buildings along Front Avenue to, to create Harbor Drive. So uh, in one case, um, the art project director sent a letter to the Commissioner of Public Works who was also involved in that and uh, sent him a copy of the, of the iconic view of Front Avenue from the Burnside Bridge and said, we're thinking about doing a painting of this photograph for your office. Um, would, would you be interested in, in doing that? And so um, it was just, it's interesting to see the historic context kind of play out versus the, the creative work. 